you so much for joining us here at the Research Her, the show working to improve the health disparities for women of color one topic at a time. I am Alicia. I'm here learning and growing with you as we research our way to well-being. Today, we will be talking to Raven Baxter. She is a science communicator and molecular biologist. She got her Bachelor of Science in Biology and Master of Arts in Cellular and Molecular Biology from State University at New York College at Buffalo. She's currently working on her PhD in Science Education at the University of Buffalo. She also creates STEM themed music that teaches and empowers both students and professionals in STEM and beyond. Raven is also the founder of STEMBACY, a science advocacy organization that embraces a diverse and accomplished membership of STEM professionals. Now it's time for us to learn from Raven. So, I like to start off the interviews with icebreaker questions. So icebreaker question one, if you could only eat one thing for the rest of your days, what would it be? Uh, Cheese. Cheese? So you would just eat cheese every day, all day, and that would be it? Honestly, yeah. (laughs) I have a problem with cheese. Like, I will go to the grocery store, the bougie one, because I need to look at the good cheese. And I will walk through the aisles and they have all of these exquisite cheeses from different parts of the world. And I feel like cheese, it goes well with wine, which is like, you know, one of my favorite drinks. And then you can just try out all the different cheeses. Yes. Yeah. I love cheese too. I actually have a cheese pizza on the way now. Yeah. I'm perfect. I'm on a quest right now for the perfect cheese platter. So if you have any recommendations, let me know. Have you gotten close to the perfect cheese platter yet? No, because I'm hella broke. Like, <laughs> am I not to cuss on this? <laughs> you can say what whatever you want to. Our audience is grown, grown. All right. <laughs> I'm broke as hell. (laughs) I feel that in my soul. So if you were not in the field of science and STEM, what would you be? I would be in fashion. Like a a designer, a model. What would it be? I would be a designer. And I'm a model currently, but I love clothes. I enjoy clothing from different decades. And I also, I guess I like blending decades together um, and experimenting with different styles of clothing. I, I really like fashion. I want to have my own fashion line eventually. That would be dope. If you could break the law one time, what would you do? I would seize land from corporations that are creating like concrete jungles and gentrifying urban spaces. I would just seize their properties and make urban farms and urban forests. Let's dive into it. So did baby Raven know that she would be a science maven? Yeah, (laughs) I didn't have a choice. (laughs) I was a really interesting kid. So I had ADHD. I still have it. But growing up, I was diagnosed. And at the time, ADHD medicines were very new on the market. And so my mother was not interested in giving me those medications. So what happened was I ended up getting into a ton of shenanigans. I would experiment with things around the house. I would mix things together. And that was honestly the beginning of my science career. I launched myself into science just out of my own curiosity. Eventually went to space camp and the rest is history. There's no specific point in time where I felt like I was going to be a scientist. I just popped up my mom's (laughs) joint (laughs) work as a scientist. Really? And so did your parents nurture your science strengths? My mom, she put me in things like Girl Scouts and things where I could experience hands-on activities and engagement in science. She's actually the one who kind of helped me get to space camp. They had a tuition scholarship where you could go for free. So I did. And it actually ended up being one of the most transformational experiences for me in my life. I'm really glad that she did that. 
So you went to State University of New York College at Buffalo for undergrad. And then for your master's, you went and continued at the university at Buffalo. Is there a reason that you wanted to stay in Buffalo? So I was born and raised here. I actually was born in Buffalo and then I moved to Greensboro, North Carolina, and I lived there until high school. And then I came back to Buffalo for high school and I stayed here ever since. And I had a really unstable childhood. And I think by the time I got to college, I really just wanted to stay in one place. I moved around a lot as a kid. So it was important for me to just have my roots somewhere and shout. Even though Buffalo isn't maybe the most exciting place to live, I really enjoy having family here and friends here and just staying put. Got it. So you're in Buffalo. It's time for you to go to college. What was the inspiration behind you majoring in biology? Did you go into your undergrad, like knowing that you wanted to be a biology major? No, I actually started my college career at State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry. And that's in Syracuse, New York. It's on the Syracuse University campus. It used to be, I believe, their Department of Forestry, and then they sold it to the state university system and made its own college. I started my freshman year of college there. I went to college when I was 16 years old. I was pretty young. All I knew at that point was I loved planet Earth. I actually found out I was afraid of heights at space camp prior. So prior to my interest in like natural sciences and life sciences, I wanted to be an astronaut. But those dreams quickly subsided once I went to space camp and found out that I don't do heights. Environmental science was my next passion. So I went away from home for school for my first year. I was young. I actually didn't do very well because I was partying. Listen, like (laughs) I was partying like crazy. And the thing was like, I was 16, but I didn't know what 18 year olds were doing. I just knew I was 16. I was like a kid in my head. But when I got to college and all these kids who were two years older than me, Uh but grown, they're adults at 18, they were doing some other stuff. So I got into all those shenanigans. I had fun, but my grades were terrible. So I ended up getting kicked out of school and I had to come home back to Buffalo from Syracuse. And I went to a community college to get my bearings because my grades weren't even good enough for me to get into a four-year institution at that point. And also at that point, my mom was pregnant and she was also going through a divorce. It was unfortunate situation all around, but it was also tough on me as somebody who kind of went through a lot their freshman year of college to come home and sit and all that. So I was really motivated to get out. And I eventually got my grades up well enough to transfer to a four year. And then I ended up at Buff State and decided that I wanted to change my major. And I changed my major once I took a genetics course because it was a required course for my degree. I fell in love with the idea of a language in your own body. I am bilingual. And at that point, I hadn't really realized that our bodies also speak a language, which is the genetic code. From there, I really wanted to focus in on genetics and molecular biology. So At that point, I decided to shift gears from environmental science to biology, and I never left. Mm -hmm. So what do you think was your biggest motivator for getting back into college and like going back? Was there a point where you wanted to give up and say, like, you know what, this was I tried, but I'm done. (laughs) (laughs) Like, what do you think kept you moving and kept you going? Well, I come from a very educated family. Everybody in my family has a college degree. Almost everyone in my family has a graduate degree. Even my great grandparents have college degrees. I come from a long line of people who really work hard for their education. My grandfather was the dean of students at a local college. His brothers were on the board of education for our public school system. So not only are we an educated family, but we're also leaders in education. Our family is very well known for that. Like if you come to Buffalo and you say my last name, Baxter, people know that you're in the education field and that you're really good at being an educator. And that's nothing to speak to what I've developed, but that's just the reputation that my family's earned 
over the past few years, I would have been super embarrassed to not finish my degree, one. And two, it was never on my mind. Even when I failed out of college, my first gut instinct was, okay, well, that was stupid. Let me get, <laughs> let me get back in the game and do this the right way. And I definitely did that. Because you fell out of your first go at college, was that attempt to get into the master's program a challenge for you? A little bit, because on grad school applications, they have this question that is asking you if you've ever been suspended from school for academic reasons, you know, et cetera. Sometimes I had to explain what happened during my freshman year of college. And those questions follow you throughout your academic career. I think I might have even had to answer that question on my PhD application. You basically have to make your case on why you're not a dumbass anymore. Besides that, my progress really spoke for itself. I didn't have a strong start when I transferred from a community college back to a four-year. Basically, my transfer looked like alphabet soup. So when I went to apply for my master's, like if you look at my transcript, I got like, you know, some low end grades when I came in from the two year school to the four year school. But then eventually I worked my way up to being on the dean's list every semester by the time I graduated. So even though I struggled, the journey, I think, will work in my favor because I was able to show growth and progress throughout my academic career. So at what point did you decide that you were going to get a master's or did you always know? I didn't always know. I was just oblivious (laughs) to what I was really getting myself into. I like learning. I love school. I love science, but I didn't really understand the academic process. Even though I'm very far from a first-gen student, it just never was explained to me. I think everybody assumed that I'm going to know because everybody else did it. That wasn't the case. I ended up going to get a master's degree because I still felt very young when I finished college. I was 20, I think, when I graduated, and I didn't feel comfortable going out into the real world. And not only that, but a lot of my friends were interested in going to medical school, and I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And so our grind looked a lot different. They were grinding to take the MCAT. I was just grinding to finish my degree, not really sure of what to do next. And also, at least where I live, finding a job with just a bachelor's in biology, really just equated to being a lab tech or doing really low level industry work, which is not necessarily something I wanted to do at that time at all. So I just jumped back into grad school immediately with no real plans or intentions of what to do after grad school. Mm -hmm. I had no idea that I was going to get a PhD. (laughs) Okay. And what ended up happening was because so many of my friends were trying to get into medical school and I didn't have a plan. I was like, well, why don't I just give it a shot? Mm. And so I ended up taking my prerequisites for medical school during my graduate school career. During my master's degree, I was taking physics. I was taking organic chemistry. I actually did pretty well in organic chemistry, but physics, (laughs) I did not understand. I struggled with it. I ended up kind of saying, well, you know what? If this is what it's going to be like for these prerequisites, then I don't really think that medical school's for me because I'm really not willing to work hard enough for this for this goal that I don't really have. Uh-huh. So let me just kind of stick it through my master's degree and kind of work it out from there. Yeah, it kind of sounds like that that wasn't your passion anyway. It was something you were doing off of the strength that you saw so many other people doing it. That, right. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And it's no way to get through med school if you aren't passionate about it at all. What inspired you to transition to science education? After my master's degree, I went straight into corporate, working as a corporate molecular scientist. So I actually graduated on a Saturday and then started that job on that following Monday. And I didn't become a science educator really until a couple of years down the line. It was during your academic teaching that you decided that you would go into science education. What was it exactly that inspired you instead of like going down that biology route that you were already? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I'm a real free spirit. And when I got to corporate working in the lab, 
be a bench pop scientist. You know, you can already see. I can only imagine. <laughs> it was very hard for me. And not only that, I was very isolated. Mm-hmm. I was the only Black person. Wow. Working in the lab doing science. The lab was in the hood. Mm. <laughs> you know, like they gentrified the hood, put the lab there, and I'm the only Black scientist there. We had a Black janitor. And he and I would give each other the head nod. And, <laughs> you know, that was my dude. Mm-hmm. And he was the only person that would talk to me or at least respect me, you know, enough to carry on a conversation with me daily. I'm a very social person. So it was killing me inside that nobody else besides him was seeing me as equal, you know, enough to get to know or form a bond of friendship with, even if it was just small talk, chit chat. Mm-hmm. Talk a little bit more about that. Did you code apply to that position or did you know someone who worked there? And how was it during the interview process? Did you feel going mm-hmm. into that particular position that you would get that type of energy? So I applied on their website, just like a regular job position. I didn't know anybody there. They were. It was just one of the very few biotech positions open that I was willing to accept that wasn't a low level job position. And it seemed like it would be a great start to my career. Prior to my experience working in corporate, I honestly have existed in mostly predominantly white environments. I was raised in the suburbs. I went to a PWI for college. I never had any really bad racially charged incidents or anything that really made me feel like I couldn't exist in those types of environments. Coming into applying to that job, during the interview, I hadn't experienced anything negative. Uh It was very much like, can you tell me about these protocols that you've done before? What are the steps? You know, basically me regurgitating everything I knew about benchtop science and They were like, okay, great. I got a call back a few days later and they wanted to hire me. And I was ecstatic. I was very excited. It was at a state-of-the-art facility. You know, they're a gigantic company. I had a great opportunity to learn a lot of different techniques and have an extremely broadened skill set in molecular biology. So I took the position and then quickly realized that I was going to have a completely different experience in this predominantly white environment and one that was very different than the ones that I had experienced before. It was very traumatic for me. And in that moment, you realized that that was not the space that you wanted to be in. Absolutely not the space I wanted to be in because I knew I deserved better. Did you feel like it was so deeply rooted that there was not a change that you as an individual could make? So here's something that happened that really helped me decide on whether I wanted to stay or not. Because I get this question sometimes when I tell people my story, they're like, should you have stayed? Was there anything you could have done to kind of fix it or any suggestions you could have made to make your situation easier? Let me tell you what happened. So... Remember I told you earlier, we had a black janitor at the job and we would give each other the head nod. Before he got hired, I was the only black person in the building. He didn't get hired until maybe a year after I started working. So for that entire year, up until when he got hired, it was just me and my blackness coming into the workspace and really just being ignored by everybody. (laughs) So I was getting my work done the best way that I could. And when they hired this Black man as a janitor, mind you, everybody pretty much was ignoring me this whole time. But all of a sudden, one of my coworkers turned to me and she said, well, isn't this great? You won't be the token Black anymore. Wait, it was a white woman? Mm -hmm. And she was my age. And (laughs) we were both at the same level of research scientists. That's what she said to me. She said wow, you know, you should be happy that you won't be the token Black anymore. And then she kind of just Laugh. walked off. Like, he, he, he. You know, it was funny to her. She thought that was okay to say. She didn't say that with the intention of hurting my feelings, but felt like that was something that was totally fine to say. And I was devastated, honestly. You know, I hate to say that she 
hurt my feelings because she didn't deserve to do that. But she really did hurt my feelings a lot because I had worked so hard to be in that space. I worked hard for my degrees. I was already shocked by how hard I was being ignored. And then to hear that this person only thought of me as a token really solidified my greatest fear, which was that people weren't seeing me as equal because to her, I wasn't just a scientist. You know, I wasn't her coworker. I was a fucking token black girl. No, not even that. I was a token black. That's what she said. But let me tell you what happened after that, right? Because this is why I decided to leave. It made me uncomfortable that she said that. Yes. They had an anonymous report line for HR where it's not attached to your name. You just put your location in the incident. And that's what I did. And I made a suggestion after I detailed everything that happened. I said, I didn't say who even called me a token Black. I just said, I was called a token Black at work. And I think you all need to come in here and do a diversity training or something. But y'all got to get y'all asses over here. And do some type of work with these people because I'm not going to be putting up with this. So instead of handling it anonymously, the head of HR drove to our work site from corporate, pulled me out from the lab. Mind you, I put in an anonymous report. Now, it was obvious because I'm the only Black person doing science there that I was the one who was called a token Black But I didn't attach my name to anything. Right. Which means that, again, you're letting me know that you know that I am the token black because, again, anonymous. (laughs) Right. So they pulled me out of the lab, Alicia, and they have a sit down meeting with me and they're interrogating me. Who called you this? Who said this to you? And I'm like, first of all, I don't want to have this conversation with you because I put in an anonymous report. But I was only 23 at the time. So I still consider that pretty young because I've grown a lot since then. So I could say I was still pretty young at that point to be able to verbalize what the fuck, like, you know, why why are y'all doing this? This is not right. I didn't understand what to say because I figured, okay, it's HR. They're supposed to be helping you. Mm -hmm. So I told them who said it. They really pressured me to do that. They didn't help me at all. They just called her in for a separate meeting where they talked to her separately and then they left and that was it. Right. So now there's this tension. There's this tension. They didn't do a diversity training. Like I asked, of course not, you know, at this point I'm like, dang. And now I'm forced into this awkward conversation with this person that I really don't know how to have this conversation because I had never dealt with this before, even though I had worked in white spaces. I just never had to tell anybody about themselves for being openly racist like that. I'm like, I don't even know what to say to you, girl. Like, (laughs) what, what do I say? You know, nothing ever came out of that. It was very awkward for me. I felt very out of place. I didn't feel protected at that workplace. That is the reason why I left. Among many other things, I could go on and on. I mean, if you think that this story sounds unfair, I could tell you a million other things that happened to me there that were just as disappointing. And so I decided to leave. Right. And you left to go teach? Yeah. So I I really felt like education was a safe space for me. Again, like my entire family, they're filled with educators. And I had really positive experiences as a student. And I really enjoy teaching. And I also, after my experiences in corporate, really felt a calling Mm -hmm. to give back to people coming into science behind me Mm -hmm. and to build a sense of worth, self-awareness, confidence, so that students coming into these fields can survive, that they can make it. Mm -hmm. Because I was not prepared for all that I experienced. And, you know, I'm not sure, I really couldn't even tell you even if I was more self-aware or confident or, you know, X, Y, and Z, if I would have stayed. Mm -hmm. But all I know is what I experienced was wrong. And I want to equip younger students in STEM with the knowledge and skills that I've learned so that they can make it through these fields. Mm -hmm. So I really enjoyed teaching. I learned a lot. You know, as soon as I got into the space teaching at the... I taught at a community college 
I saw how badly I was needed there. I will walk into these rooms. These are my favorite days, like the first day of class, because I was still young. I was 23, 24 when I started working as a professor. I will walk into the classroom. (laughs) Nobody would think that I was the professor. I would go to the podium (laughs) and somebody would be like, why are you standing there? (laughs) I'm like, I'm your professor. (laughs) Yeah. But the beautiful thing about that was seeing everybody's face in response light up with joy. Mm -hmm. It wasn't even shock. It was just like, whoo, damn, it's about time. Right, right. (laughs) A relatable figure. Yes. I taught very diverse community college courses and not just in ethnicity or race, but age. I had grandmothers in my classes with recent high school graduates. Buffalo has a very large immigrant population and refugee population. So I was teaching people from all over the world. It was just amazing for me to see how many people were so excited to see a Black woman teaching science. So excited. We're really needed in those spaces. I mean, aside from them being excited to see me, I also feel like I was able to speak to them in a way that they could understand. I feel like I brought in elements to the teaching that other professors weren't doing because it wasn't the status quo. One of those things being that I would love to infuse creative work in my science classes. I always gave creative assignments and opportunities for people to express their minds and their own selves. That was one of the best parts of my teaching, I think. Uh You are transitioning and it's time for you to go get a PhD. I still want to know (laughs) what inspired you to pursue a PhD and then specifically in science education. It's kind of two parts to that. I actually applied to a biology PhD program and a science education PhD program. I only applied to two programs. At this point, I'm still honestly wasn't aware of the academic process. (laughs) I didn't know that most people apply to several, upon several PhD programs. I just was like, okay, well, I think I'm smart. Let me just apply to these two and pick from the two. (laughs) So here's what happened. I actually was considered for a biology PhD by the school that I applied to, University at Buffalo. I applied to the two programs at that school, science ed and biology. The biology PhD interview process, Alicia. Uh. (laughs) (laughs) Tell me about it. Tell me about it. (laughs) Uh. Okay, let me just set this up for you. Okay. At this point, I had about two years of corporate molecular research under my belt at one of the most rigorous companies on this East Coast. I also had about a year and a half of college teaching under my belt in biology. I was extremely confident that I was going to be an awesome biology PhD student. And I was ready to get in there and just do the work because I love science and I work hard. I'm interviewing and they have us in a room. It was a three-day interview process. And the first day They stuck us all in a room together. We were in there with, I believe, the chair of the biology department. They were talking to us and looking at us. I just got the worst feeling because it felt like I was entering some sort of horrible like rat race. Everyone else was nervous. And I'm like, I got this. I've done the work. I've already proven that I can get here. Shoot, I even have a master's degree, you know, on top of all this other stuff. So I go through, I'm interviewing with all of these people. I'm telling them about all this work that I've done. Again, in my corporate experience, I worked on many different projects. I worked for a contract research organization, which meant that I was working on different projects every month that all required different skill sets and different knowledge of machinery etc. So I was very well versed in different areas, molecular biology and cell biology as a whole. And so I'm having these conversations with these professors and they're like in these very specialized, like, I've been looking at C. elegans neurons for 20 years. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And I'm like, all right, I mean, I can do that for four years. Like, what's up? And I think that it scared them that I was unfazed by the rigor 
by the expectations of the program. I was just ready to get in there and work. Uh I made it to the final day of interviews and they invited everybody to the chair's house for dinner. I had this realization, right? All the candidates were in the chair's house. A lot of the faculty were there as well. We're all eating dinner together. I realized that really nobody was talking to me. Wow. At this point, aren't you desensitized to people not (laughs) talking to you because you just left this job that you were there for two years and you have been getting ignored. So how did it feel now that you're back in that same space? Honestly, I was not feeling it because I had already earned my stripes by that point. And I knew that I was worthy of being talked to. It was a different feeling from when I was in corporate and I was a little bit younger and I had just came out of grad school. I didn't really have much to my name besides my degree. I was still kind of scared in that space. I was still hurt when people didn't talk to me in that space. It made me feel bad. But when people didn't talk to me in this space that I'm talking about right now in the PhD program, after I had worked corporate for years and taught for years. And I even at that time had a position at a four-year university teaching and advising. And like, I had so much under my belt. I was like, these people don't want to talk to me. Oh no, this is not, uh uh-uh, no. I knew better at that point. I was taking notes. I was very cordial and polite and I was still very grateful for the opportunity, but I was taking notes. I was still expressing a very sincere interest in the program. However, when push came to shove, they ended up not admitting me because they said, and this was their words, they said that they didn't think that I would be interested in the program. Oh, that was their words. And so there it was. I was left with a very bitter taste in my mouth after that. What I noticed was that I had other things to offer besides just being a scientist. And that's something that I've always been grateful for was that I'm well-rounded and I'm lucky that I am almost just as passionate about education as I am about doing, you know, research and being in the lab and et cetera. It honestly was a kick in the right direction because when I look back on how toxic being in that type of research environment is, I'm really glad I went and decided to pursue a PhD in science ed. The PhD in science ed at the very same school, they accepted me. I'm on a fellowship. I'm doing great. And my advisor is a Black woman. She's the only Black woman in the department. She's been an amazing advocate for me. And I'm really grateful for her. It honestly wasn't my first choice, but it was the best choice for me. Yeah. So would you change anything about your academic pursuit? I wouldn't have taken a student loan out during my master's program. Okay. That's it. Okay. Speak more to that. Like, What would have been the alternative? I wish that I had known about scholarships and fellowships. And I really rushed into the decision to go to get my master's degree and didn't really know that I had options for funding. I did get a stipend through my program, but there wasn't anything that would go towards my tuition necessarily. So I just wish that I didn't take out a student loan and that I had other options. That's honestly my biggest regret. Yeah. Understood. What led you to your current research field? I feel like this is a trend for all of my academic transitions, really almost every transition in my life. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I just had to go on faith that this was the right choice because I love educating. I love being an academic for the most part, or at least at that time I did. I didn't have a focus. Other than I like science, I like teaching. So I'm in a science ed program. Boom. That's it. That's all I had. So as I was taking my introductory doctoral coursework, I experienced the greatest relief in my life coming out of the hard sciences. Even though I was still studying science, I was studying how to teach science, using my expertise, and I'm putting a cultural and sociological twist on my scientific knowledge and how to apply that in education. I was relieved because the pressure of working in corporate, working in these environments where you have to be perfect Uh type of research that you're doing, but not only, you know, literally perfect because of what you're doing with your hands, but also 
appearing a certain way, walking a certain way, talking a certain way, basically whitewashing yourself. You know, I'll just keep it plain and simple. I was coming out of that environment and I was so relieved to see that science education really embraces people as their unapologetic selves. When you are training to become an educator, one of the first things that they teach you is to put it out of your head that everybody's the same because people learn different ways. People are coming into the classroom with different values, different ideas, different perspectives. And all of these things come with different theories, you know, different practices, applications, but they're all valued in the classroom. And so I started to value that in myself. I really learned so much about myself and the way that I was thinking. The first thing that I noticed was that I was being challenged when I started my science ed degree. I didn't know how to think. When we train as research scientists in STEM, we think very analytically and very infrequently are we asked about our personal opinions, our values, our stances, and what's important to us. It's always us grinding for the man or whoever's research lab you're in, et cetera. So learning about other people, learning about myself was very freeing. And I had to take a step back once I kind of discovered this freedom to explore other Black women's experiences in STEM. How are they feeling? What were they experiencing? What are their stories? How does this all tie into representation in science, people's identities in science, how to progress the science and the culture around science? That became my focus once I took a step back out of the hard sciences and into the education field. So I became woke (laughs) to my own experiences and struggles and decided to focus in on that. Getting into your research, what ways do underrepresented populations in STEM form their identities within the context of science culture? Great question. We know a few things. Role modeling is one, and that can come in many forms, but mentoring in person Even just seeing somebody who looks like you, like can't remember who did it, but I did read about a study that was done on a group of Black students where the researchers created a fake website that had fake faculty listings and they varied the faculty by race, gender, et cetera. And they found that the Black students wanted to attend the fake university with the With the Black faculty. They also found that Black students were already forming opinions about non-Black faculty and how they would be treated based on the way that the faculty profiles were written, based on the ethnicity of the person. The researchers were able to decide or determine based on the ethnicity of the person how valued a student would feel in the classroom or on that campus. Uh Things like that help to kind of shift people's decisions and form people's identities in in STEM. The media also affects it, your upbringing. If you have people who can broker you into the STEM field, like let's say your uncle was an engineer at Boeing and you knew about STEM that way, that's called brokering. Tell us a little bit about your research. My research studies how adults identify with media representations of science and scientists. My goal with my research was to fill a gap in the literature. We're widely looking at how kids relate to images in the media of scientists. We're only looking at people who are in STEM fields and their interpretations of scientists in the media. The gap in the literature is that we know that there's an underrepresentation of Black women in STEM. Yes. But we're not getting the stories of the women who didn't choose STEM. Nobody's asking them, why didn't you choose STEM? Whenever you see a study that's talking about the underrepresentation of Black women in science, they're always asking Black women in science about their experiences when the key is with those who were steered away from the field and decided to do something else. Maybe they didn't even really like STEM to begin with, but it could very much have been that they did pursue STEM. And it didn't work out for a variety of reasons. I just finished the first half of my research and I interviewed 50 Black women 
half of them are in STEM professional careers and the other half are in non-STEM professional careers. So I have people across the board in physics and engineering and math, et cetera, along with attorneys and judges and people who work for child protection services. Man, when I tell you that the story is consistent across the board and that not only are Black women in STEM experiencing trauma because they feel like they can't be themselves at work. In fact, 85% of the women I interviewed of the 50 said they can't be themselves at work. 85%. And that's including the STEM and the non-STEM. Yeah. It also turned out that all of these women, whether they were in STEM or not, 98% of my total participant count identified the most popular image of a scientist in America as white. And then 80% said male. Almost the same percentage of women felt like they couldn't relate to those images. Uh You know, when I asked them, if that's what you think is the most common representation, how do you relate with that? A lot of them were like, oh, that's definitely not me. Even the women who were in STEM. The center of my doctoral study is a music video that I created, and it is actually meant to crush those very narratives that I just spoke on, that white men are scientists. Really, the goal of the music video was to provide a counter narrative to that and say that not only are Black women scientists, but we are fun, we are sexy, we are multifaceted. We like rap music. We like fast cars and tight clothes. You know, I mean, that's my narrative. I don't want to put that on every Black woman. I put that in this music video that I made. I showed it to all of these women. I asked them, how does that make you feel? And mind you, this is both women in STEM and not in STEM. 70% of all the women were like, I have never seen anything like this before. And 80% of the women said that they have never even seen a Black woman scientist in the media. So them seeing that music video, their mind was blown. So I asked the women who didn't have STEM careers, I said, well, if you would have had this representation earlier in your life, being that you've never seen anything like this before, how do you think that would impact your decision to have a STEM profession? 78% of the women who didn't have STEM careers said that they would have tried to pursue a STEM career if they had that representation, if they knew that Black women could exist in the field and be their unapologetic selves and didn't have to whitewash themselves, et cetera, or at least have an example of what that looked like. Some message of, hey, y'all belong in this field. Come join the fun. Bring your friends too. Yeah. So like those are some of the preliminary findings of my research. Really excited about it. I think that it's definitely going to fill an important gap in what we know about Black women in science. What was the name of that video? Big Old Geeks. And where can we find that at? You can find Big Old Geeks on YouTube. Just type in Big Old Geeks. Yeah. The song is also on music platforms as well. Mm -hmm. What was the most surprising thing that you found during your research up until this point? Ooh, this is actually one of my favorite things that I found. For a lot of the Black women in my study, they cited twerking as therapeutic. I never asked any questions about the dancing that was done in the music video that I showed them. I didn't say anything about the twerking. But independently, multiple Black women in the study said that they twerk to get by during the day. Uh huh. Uh huh. Even one of the women in the study went into further detail on her thought about that. And she was talking about chakras and things like that. And I'm not familiar with that. I am going to look into it as I write about the research, but it is evident that parts of our culture that we are erasing from our identities when we walk into these workspaces are actually some of the very things that help us to get by. And we're actually doing ourselves a disservice (laughs) by stripping away these little things. You know, a small little booty shake when your Western blot (laughs) comes out right. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. That's okay. I'm not saying bust it down to the floor, but do your thing. Don't be afraid to do your little thing that makes you comfortable in your space. I love that you said that because my manuscript was accepted 
today. And when I say I was in lab and I screamed and I gave a look, I, I didn't stand up. I'm going to be honest. I'm going to say I sat in my chair and I just kind of gave it a look, you know, look, look back at it. <laughs> I just kind of looked back at it like, out. hey, it was just how I felt. I wanted to express my joy for my manuscript being accepted today. And the fact that you said that, thank you. Thank you. I just, it, it, that's what it immediately made me think of. Like, why did I feel the need to scream? Hey, and like, kind of give a look back at it in my chair. I mean, it's joyous and it's therapeutic and that is okay. It's integral to my happiness, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yours and many other women's. And I think we all know this, but we don't really talk about it in the professional space. Uh -huh. Because even though twerking has been talked about in an uneducated manner, yes, it's been marketed and described as unprofessional. It's not because it's a cultural dance. This is a dance that originated in Africa. And spread out through the diaspora. Hip shaking movements are everywhere. They're in Jamaica. We whine in Jamaica. We do, oh my God, Sandungueo or Perreo in Puerto Rico. Honduras has the Punta, you know, and in America, we twerking. It's all pretty much the same thing. It's all cultural. And culture should be celebrated. Culture should not be shunned. If we're talking about, oh, we value diversity and inclusion, let me twerk in the lab. That's my cultural dance. I don't care how it's been marketed by appropriators such as Purdue Chicken. <laughs> 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 what, what did, uh, what did Nicki Minaj call her? I'm playing. Miley Cyrus, when she appropriated twerk culture and everybody at that point had become aware of it through mainstream, you know, even though we've been twerking forever, people looked at Miley messing it up, <laughs> not, not even doing it right. You know, not even in a classy way. Cause I know any black woman listening to this knows that there is a classy twerk and then there's, there's different flavors of twerk. Miley was doing something that we don't, I don't know what she was, but that is what everybody learned about twerking in America who wasn't aware of it. So now there's this extra stigma around it. There already was a stigma around it because it was a black folks thing. But then when Miley came out here acting a fool, she kind of ruined it. And it never had the same flavor after that, even though, you know, we still do it and we claim it as our own. Like it's been appropriated and people aren't having these educated discussions around black culture. They're just sucking up the culture and tossing it out like it's nothing. I really value including things like this in my practices because I know there's nothing wrong with it. And it's a historical cultural thing. In what ways did you find your research to be helpful for developing and managing your STEM programs? Ooh, my goal has always been to normalize minorities in STEM, especially Black women, but also Black people as a whole, and marginalize people, people who really don't get their voices heard, and people who feel like they have to enter into spaces not as themselves and take away parts of their identity that really matter, really should be valued. So in working to create educational programs and even just as being a science communicator as a whole, I always advocate for people that I'm talking to to be their unapologetic selves. If we're talking about specifically the education space, there is something called reality pedagogy. It's a theory or a practice founded by Chris Emden. And he is a very prominent scholar in urban education, hip hop education, and science education. He's one of my inspirations academically. Hopefully one day I can meet him, but I think I'm honestly too ratchet for him. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he probably real busy. He was given a TED Talk, Chris Emden. He said, I will not hide my ratchet self to make a broken system powerful. I will not be made to be less than because I choose to be myself. I will not judge brilliance by how I think it looks or sounds. I will be equally as ratchet as academic. Oreo, no more. I will teach and be ratchet-demic. And when he said that, it really validated everything that I had been feeling and everything that I felt was right to communicate in everything that I did. Currently, I work in a charter school that is over 90% Black. 
teacher population, I <laughs> think there's only three black teachers in the school, and there's 400 students. Three black teachers. Everybody else is white. I have one Hispanic teacher, and he teaches Spanish. I noticed that these teachers who were not black were forcing our black students into this narrative. They didn't really know that they were doing this, but white supremacy. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it rains. Yeah. They, they're tone policing our students. They're not uplifting our students. A lot of teachers are, but I see some teachers really kind of look at our students in the way that they talk, the way that they dress and how they behave and just think they're never really going to have a chance. But they're going to have a chance. Maybe not by your standards, but yeah, they're going to get out here and and they're capable of doing great things. Mm -hmm. I really try to break that system when they walk into my classroom. Chris Emden promotes reality pedagogy. It focuses on teachers gaining an understanding of student realities and then using that info as a starting point for instruction. Right. So, like for example, when Juice World passed. Yeah. And my students were distraught and Juice World passed from a drug overdose. So I had to address it in the classroom. None of the other teachers would talk about it because he was a rapper. And they also don't want to acknowledge that drug use is a reality for a lot of our students. Maybe our students don't use drugs or hard drugs, but people in the communities do. We're in a hood. Okay. Like the hood is the hood. And so these students come to my classroom, they're overwhelmed. They weren't able to talk about Juice World's death all day. And they get to my classroom and they're just like breaking down crying. And I let them talk about it. And, you know, we have a conversation about why he might have done what he did and why he died. I've been teaching chemistry this past year. I was able to break it down into a chemistry lesson, a toxicology lesson about drugs and overdoses. It was a teaching opportunity. That's reality pedagogy. That's Um, so dope. Yeah. You have to really embody that. This isn't something that they teach you. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of seek out these techniques to work with these students. And a lot of people won't do it. You know, that's what I do. Like when I build programs, um, always personalize it to whatever student population I'm working with and what their culture is. Mm -hmm. Is there a topic that you wish were studied more in STEM education? Want to say allyship? (laughs) Or anti-racist teaching, really missing, for sure. Because even though we teach about how the nature of science looks different for everyone, like, for example, science is a subjective term, like Native Americans have different scientific beliefs than Western culture, you know, as a whole, than Eastern culture. Everybody's interpretation of science is different. We learn that in our programs. I feel like there's still a disconnect with people who maybe aren't as open-minded, people still justify white supremacy and say that, well, you know, if you can't do an experiment with a control and this and that, why is your opinion even valid? Uh Uh For example, we had a lesson where we were watching African people walking on fire and immersing themselves in fire. And they, the African people believe that it was a spiritual event. It was a ritual and that it was magic that they weren't being burned. I really had to sit through white people debating whether this was science or not. When the real issue is it's science to them. That's their scientific belief. That's their scientific thought. Right. They still consider themselves advocates, allies, you know, understanding interculturalness and X, Y, and Z, but still couldn't understand that in them not being able to accept that people think about science differently, that they're kind of still perpetuating white supremacy, (laughs) decolonizing. That's what we call it. Decolonizing. Yeah. Decolonizing as education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What can we expect to see out of Raven in the future? Lots of things. I'm giving a keynote soon. A SciComm 2020. Uh, I am giving a TEDx talk. It will be live broadcasted on September 12th. And that is a virtual event as well, COVID. (laughs) And I'm really excited about that. I'm basically going to be talking about my research and going into depth about my story and connecting it to my research. 
in the meantime, between now and then, I'm actually developing a series for television called Nerdy Jobs. I am going to have my own series. I am going to be basically being super Black and talking about science. (laughs) It's like a cross between Legally Blonde meets Dirty Jobs meets BET. I'm also writing a book. I got a book agent. I'm with ICM Partners, which is pretty cool. We are developing that right now. The glow up is real. You've been through everything (laughs) that you've been through for a purpose and it's taught you so much. So it's all greatness continuing on and it's only going to grow and glow pushing forward. People doubt the black girl magic, but it's definitely undeniable. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. I don't know what it is about black women, but we are executors. If we see a need, if we have a goal, we execute. Period. That's one thing that I've always been grateful for. There was never a question about that. And I see so many Black women in my life who are prime examples of greatness and success and follow through and confidence. And even if they're not quite there yet, yeah, like I've seen people grow into that. And it's a beautiful thing. And then how can we connect with you after this episode? You can find me on Instagram at Raven the Science Maven. I'm on Twitter at Raven Sci Maven. Well, thank you. If you want to connect with me, I am at the Research Her on the socials or at the researchher.com. And until next time, I'll holla. <laughs>